So we are both uh, from Pretty Easy Privacy, and Pretty Easy Privacy is somewhat of a mm, easier version of uh, Pretty Good Privacy, PGP. So first of all, I would like to know who of you is using P or who knows what PGP is? GPG, PGP. Okay, who's using it? Okay, who's using it daily? Okay, <laughs> that's already <laughs> much less. Um, and who was trying to use it in a group for somewhat of an action and gave up on the way? No one. Ah. What? Okay. Who was actually trying uh, to use it for a group and didn't give up and it worked? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so now it's the two of us. Later, Walter will be joining uh, the stage. Uh, this is Nana. Nana uh, is working on sustainable transformation since long time. She has studied philosophy, mathematics, and psychology and holds a PhD in Applied Economics. Um, she's also working with self-organized movements and uh, um, brings academic expertise in complex systems. And um, she's working with the PEP Foundation as well as with the research group for ethical and ecological rating at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Yeah, uh, I can say some words to Swa. Um, Swa plays an active role in the oldest hacker association of the world, the KS Computer Club in Berlin, or in Germany, I mean, we spread over Germany, but she's particularly active in Berlin. Um, she does conference since, since a long time, is a board member of this uh, KS Computer Club now, and um, also has co-founded and mentored various hack spaces. So she also has a very long track record in um, building infrastructures for these, uh, these kinds of activism uh, work. In India, she's active for a long time um, to establish the Hill Hacks, which is a large conference there as well, and Hack Beach in which is also, it's a conference? Oh, it's a conference. Both of them are hacker camps, <coughs> like with yeah. the conference. <laughs> um, then she had multiple crypto parties and is also a member of the crypto party admin team in um, based in Berlin. And today she continues working on the goal to have privacy by default. We are both engaged for mass encryption. We will tell you more about this later. Um, at the PEP Foundation, where we are working together. She holds a diploma or has graduated in a cultural anthropology, follows philosophy and computer science in Munich. And um, here I have some words with which about Sva, which I really liked, uh, which is a event guru and crypto missionary. So this is really what she is. Great. Um, we also have some words on the Cypherpunks manifesto. So as Nana already mentioned, uh, we're trying to implement mass encryption as a counterpart for mass surveillance. Um, this is more uh, like long-term plan, um, but the, yeah, the cypherpunk manifesto is something where the whole group is also standing on. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to read out that. Uh, um, I decided to not read out the uh, quotes as such. But I'd like to give an overview. There are three rough ideas that are basic for this manifesto, <coughs> which is first accessibility or common good. Uh, privacy should be a common good and it, it should be accessible for all. And the second is, can I see that? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, we need to have anonymity through encryption. So encryption <coughs> is the, the technology or the way to get privacy. Um, and in the end, we have to do it ourselves. If we want to have privacy, we have to make it because we cannot expect that it, I don't know, falls from the sky or that the powerful entities on this planet will give it to us. So, and these are three key points outlined in the Cypherpunk Manifesto, which is from 93. Um, and as, as well, the PEP Foundation as such, or PEP as an organization as such, as well as we as, a, as persons stand in the tradition of this manifesto. Therefore, it's, we said we would like to start with that as a notion. So, 
So um, now I will start to introduce pretty easy privacy as a concept and also as, as we do with our organization. So perhaps can you speak? Okay. So we are in the process of um, having a RFC consultation process in the IETF. So I will tell you later what this is exactly. And this this uh, internet draft describes how PEP is done technically. And here it starts with what it is. So it is building on already already available security formats and message, message transports. That means we don't make own encryption. Pretty easy privacy describes protocols to automatize operations, key management, key discovery, private key handling. Uh, this means we automatize those steps that used to have been done by the user in terms of installation and configuration. Um, and email that have been seen to be barriers to deployment of end-to-end -end secure impersonal messaging. So this is the key point that we want to make the usability as easy as possible, which is, to say it frankly, it's not been seen anymore for the user. So this is the idea. We move it into the background, but it's still there. It's state-of-the-art encryption. Um, yeah, so PEP is a cross-platform abstraction to easily use existing crypto tools. This is what I said. We use GNU PG. We implemented it in the core code, but it does have an own core, soft, an own <coughs> core software which does this uh, protocol around the encryption itself. Uh, PEP's long-term goal is to actually encrypt all digital written communication. Uh, as for now, we are starting with email, so there are releases out for the email already, but we want to also use it for OTR and um, messaging and all kinds of stuff. So this is uh, so we really try to have a long-term goal. Um, we want PEP to encrypt automatically whenever and with whatever most privacy enhancing so the PEP software chooses the uh, uh, encryption way that is the most privacy enhancing. Crypto standard is available and the slogan privacy by default means that we try to have it installed and used by default so the user does, doesn't have to do any opt-in or opt-out, it doesn't have to do any installation, the installer just installs, it doesn't ask questions. Um, this is um, so the, the, result, the result is that we get a user experience similar to Signal or WhatsApp if somebody uses WhatsApp. So it is somehow encrypted, but the encryption happens in the background and you don't have to like do it yourself. So we're taking away those needs uh, from the users and still enable everybody to have state of the art encryption. Um, and uh, as said, uh, PEP is, of course, it's a, a startup, so we try to establish our organization, but we do have a political activism idea behind it in terms of that we want to roll out mass encryption to optimize the costs of mass surveillance. Like, we want to make it as expensive as possible so that the authorities have it, it's more difficult for them to get all the emails, for instance. Um, also, I won't go into details on the developer side, but we also have the idea that uh, other mm, app developers use it, so there are very simple APIs for different programming languages. So if app developers want to use patent technology, they can just use it very, very easily, and they, do, they also don't have to hassle with the, crypto, with the crypto behind it. And of course, the user won't have to as well. And we just started the PEP. Um, Organizers, so there are several entities, we'll come back to that later, but the whole thing started in 2012 and the PEP Foundation for which we are here uh, started in, it was founded in 2015 and we're effectively working since last year. Then, um, as already said, here you can see like an overview on the key point and the features we provide. It automatically encrypts. It encrypts the subject line, for for instance, already, so it moves it into the body. Um, 
no key management is needed, um, no keys are for no, no other central infrastructure, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's um, end-to-end, and we use Finger, we use trust words instead of fingerprints. If you know uh, PGP, you are familiar with these fingerprints, these long lines of uh, uh, numbers. And we have a, a, a mapping <coughs> towards natural language words, which means that it's much more easy to compare them. Um, there is an opt-in for a passphrase of keys. You can also use it without that. Um, and the header is encrypted and obfuscated. And we do have an innovation, an innovative solution for key synchronization between devices. We'll also come back to that later. It's just here. It's, it's just an overview so that you see what we provide. Um, and as I said, we have this activism idea. We, we were really trying to do <coughs> everything right in the terms, in terms of that we try to focus on what's politically important and focus on what's technolo technologically important to get privacy deployed within the normal society to enable the normal citizen to use it, to enable activists to use it, to enable dissidents or other people that are active with really important work in the, in the jobs they're doing to have encryption and not being forced to learn all this technical stuff if they want to save time for the job they're actually doing. And of course, it's all free software. And uh, we, are, we have a very close eye on audits. The core technology has been audited very sharply already. And uh, the idea is that every proper release will be audited as well. So um, we try to make it as transparent as possible and as secure, of course, as possible. Um, and another thing is that it's important for us is it's also that we try to have it as compatible as, as possible. So it, it can be used on multiple platforms. It can be used with or it, in, it uses multiple crypto te not technology technologies. As I, as I already said, it's good for multiple programming languages. And in the long run, we want to provide solutions for multiple message transport systems as well. So we really try to uh, just open the doors to easy encryption by the PAP solution so that these things can, can be spreaded much more easily. Um, one point I would like to stress here because it's one of our main things in the middle run. So mm, as I said, some releases are out already for email. Um, and the next thing we're really working hard on that is that we have an idea how to encrypt metadata. This is who communicates with whom, when, and from where. So as for now, there is no technical solution to protect the metadata as well, meaning that even if you encrypt your email bodies, like the content, the whole social graph can be intercepted, which is important if you like work in, yeah, sensitive environments where the people would like to know who you are talking to. Um, and there is a long-term cooperation with a project called GNUnet, and GNUnet provides a way to, on a on a peer-to-peer -peer open source basis, protect metadata. And we'll, now the next step will be that we uh, work on the first tentative steps to integrate those two projects. So it could well be that uh, PEP offers a way to protect metadata for the first time within the next several years, I would say. Um, in the end, our slogan is privacy by default. In terms of that, as I said, the installer just installs. It doesn't ask any questions. It's quick. And it does for you, for the user, what the user would want to do if it was a professional user who really know, knew how to use PGP correctly. So if you know how to use it correctly, everything is fine. You can also just stick to that. But if you don't know, you can also use PEP, and it provides you with the same service. Yeah. So um, this is it again. It's so to say a little hacker inside of your machine that does it for you. And you can be sure that uh, it does it all right. And, um, it's also much more easier to invite other people to use uh, encryption as well because it's easy for them then as well. So that's the idea. 
Now I said we have a RFC, and I said it's a protocol that automatized the steps to taught to users as crypto, as crypto parties. So the question is, um, <laughs> yeah, who who knows what a protocol means in that <coughs> context? Context. Okay, just a few who knows what RFC means in that context. Okay, the same few. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll be explaining that a bit more. Um, but the idea is um, just to so go, uh, yeah, to go back to this one. Um, if you see, it's this little hacker inside. So um, for everyone who doesn't know about the protocols, can still imagine that. Um, we, in a daily base, when we communicate to each other, each time we decide what kind of communication we use. Like I'm talking to someone, I'm leaving the house and I say, okay, now I'm switching on mobile, what app do you have? Let's switch there. So every time I'm deciding in my head what uh, communication method I'm going to use, but this is um, what yeah we can do because we are into this. But we cannot expect this from everyone in the world, so we're trying to put this into um, into a, a set of rules. Um, we'll be coming back to this later. What a protocol actually means, and uh, to but it's kind of a set of rules how to communicate to each other, and um, to have such a protocol, you need this thing called RFC, and uh, to explain both of it. Um, we'll be stepping a huge step back um, into the late 50s and now I'm making a quick run through uh, where the internet came from so that we're all somewhat on the, on the same base when we're talking about um, the ideas, especially GNUnet, uh, what's the plan to change. So when we wrote the first um, email to Kirsten and Edri, uh, the other guys from Edri, uh, and they were asking what would be the main outcome of this session. Um, we were like, we want to give back hope to the hopelesses. So the idea is to explain to you where the internet comes from and where uh, is the like underlying problem of all and where might be the solutions, at least the solution we're uh, proposing, which is not something, okay, PEP you can use right ahead, but this only makes your email encrypted. Um, this is only, uh, uh, you, you only work on a symptom here, but it's not really currying from the roots. But the other approach of really changing the internet infrastructure is gonna change a lot, and it's gonna uh, like make some of our problems just disappear. But to understand that, you somewhat need to know where the internet comes from. So um, uh, we decided to start with the late 50s when um, Sputnik was uh, put into space by the Russians. So there is no actual beginning point. Um, people would set the beginning at various places, so we just decided to put the Cold War as uh, the starting point because the USA had to respond to that Sputnik shock. Um, so they founded the Advanced Research Project Agency, which was the ARPA, um, renamed in 72 into the DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project Agency. Um, the special thing of that task force was that they haven't had any particular order. It was just like, okay, do something better than the Russians have just done. There is nothing like all those legends that they actually created the the internet to be safe from wars and all this, this all just came later. The original idea was just, okay, now they have done something awesome, now, now we give you money to do something awesome as well. So they got lots of money and especially they got autonomy, um, which is very special in the, in the defense context, in the military context. Usually the researchers are somewhere hidden in their cellars and they're not allowed to publish, they're not allowed to go to uh, conferences, but here it was different. Those guys were publishing things. So this is the first publication in 61, uh, information flow in large communication networks. So um, this guy, Kleinwalk, had the idea of packet switching networks. 
So that was a PhD thesis, he just wrote it. Um, some of you might think now, okay, packet switching, what's this about? Um, you might have seen those things in old movies where um, when you had to make a call, you actually say, hello, can I get, uh, in German we say, ein Amt. I don't know what it was in English though. Um, and then the lady was saying, okay, I connect you. And then they were actually connecting those lines. Um, so this way of communication was actually till uh, yeah, the um, 70s, uh, it was still there in the 60s, 70s, that uh, when you were taking a call that you actually got connected, your telephone got connected to the telephone you wanted to call to in one line. So now this guy, Kleinrock, had the idea of packet switching, which means um, that you are not connected in one line anymore, but the whole communication gets splits, split into packets, and those packets get sent somewhere along the lines that are existing, and at the end they uh, are put together again to get again a voice message or whatever it was. Back then they weren't experimenting with voice, voice messages though, but with like text and all this. So uh, right ahead in 62, another Gaelic leader wrote a series of memos discussing the intergalactic computer network uh, where he was imagining a lot of computers connected to each other. At this time, time sharing already existed, um, which was a multi-user system for mainframe systems where lots of users could use the same computer at like different times, but also remotely. So the idea of um, being connected to a computer from a remote location, like not sitting at the computer, was already there. Um, so it continued with some publications. Then in uh, 67, there was a big conference. And uh, 69, the first four computers are connected. So this is often mm -hmm. the birth of the internet. Um, this was the ARPA network, uh, which looked like this on the map. And, um, and it it grown really fast in those years. And the speciality here, what I would like to have you remember, is that at the beginning, those inventors are both. They're users and developers at the same time, as well as the technology is both. It's the object of research and it's the media for public publication. This was like a very new thing. Usually, yeah, you were either a user or you, you are a developer. This is like nowadays. And um, usually you were... Um, researching something and you were public like publishing somewhere else because there wasn't anything before um, so that media for publication that like internet that started to um, slowly exist um, gave the opportunity to just publish any thoughts and any ideas you had which leads us to um, the RFCs which means request for comments this is from the very beginning till today, the way how um, decisions are made, um, what the technology standards of the internet. Um, so this is where technical and organizational issues are discussed. So someone makes a request for comments, others comment on it, and um, they keep that name <coughs> and they often got standards. So if someone has an idea and says, okay, let's do it like that, and everyone's like, oh, this is great, let's do it like that, then just everyone's doing it. This is like if you have a web server and you say, oh, I, I want to like, make a different technology and I use my web server in a different way, then no one is able to use it because no one agreed on, okay, this is a technology we could use. Everyone agreed on using HTTP as a technology which you have in front of your, of your web URL. And so every web browser is able to read what every web server is delivering. So today we have around 8,500 RFC, and I just picked some examples here. Um, very early one is FTP, the file transfer protocol. Um, I come to this later when it actually got invented. <coughs> then uh, there is uh, DNS, the uh, domain name system, um, which uh, transports IP addresses to names. Um, then Usenet, IP addresses, Gopher, which was a similar system than the web. Uh, IRC, um, then the assigned numbers for um, also domain si systems. But then at the bottom, I also picked out three different ones. One is ethics and the internet. 
So this already has been discussed already quite early. See the number. Then, sure, recursiveness is uh, something in that technology you find everywhere. Instructions how to write an RFC. So there's an RFC on how to write an RFC. And then also uh, iCalendar and everything that is established nowadays also gets an RFC. Like PEP also now started to draft an RFC. So nowadays there is a two-step system. Before you uh, give out the RFC, you first make a draft because otherwise it would have gotten too much. Okay, so this internet was growing here. Some uh, pictures with uh, how it looked like then, uh, end of the 70s. And here's a list of stuff that happened in the 70s. So especially 97, the network control protocol, the NCP, um, was, was ready and usable. Um, this was, yeah, the protocol on how two computers uh, can talk to each other. So there were applications <coughs> developed. There was Telnet to connect computers, there was FTP to connect information, and there was email to connect people. <coughs> um, interestingly, email already had like 75% of the whole network usage was email. So people were always keen on um, using it for um, their purposes. Then uh, 73, also uh, some vendors, PC vendors, were trying to in implement their own net which fortunately didn't work out. So the net always stayed free and open. Um, 75 is an interesting uh, cultural point where there was a first non-tech mailing list, science fiction lovers, um, which was kind of a uh, very huge discussion. Um, and then TCP IP came, but we'll come to this protocol thing later. Um, 79, there was the first documented use of a smiley, <laughs> uh, tongue in cheek, it looked like that. And uh, 79, the Usenet and BBS system started, which was kind of the ARPANET for the people. Remember, the ARPANET was still for military use only, and then the science scientists also took it over, but then it was also there for the people. Here's an overview of the 80s. Uh, sure, Chaos Computer Club was founded. I need to mention that. <laughs> then uh, the Milnet splits from the ARPANET. So the uh, military crowd figured, okay, there are way too many people running around in our network, so let's just split it. Most of the nets, uh, of the nodes, uh, went to the millnet. Um, the upper net was then pretty small. Um, but then you see at the bottom uh, that the uh, National Science Foundation was also founded uh, a network, like the NSF net, which took over um, the, being the backbone. And yeah, there was the transi transition from uh, NCP to TCP IP. So everyone had to uh, make that transition at the very same second, which was very funny. So that's why they all got those buttons, I survived. Um, cyberspace appeared for the first time and the domain name system came out. Then uh, 1990, the ARPANET is switched off. Um, but the users don't reckon because of this uh, National Science Foundation backbone. And, very important here, Tim Berners-Lee writes an application which is called the World Wide Web, which was just like yet another application. Um, you know all the World Wide Web nowadays, this is what most of the people do when they say they go online, they go to the internet, they actually go to the web. They're not using the internet, they're only using the web. Um, which is then using the internet, but uh, yeah, there is much more. You see, this is now already 20 years of internet, um, and there haven't hasn't been any web. Um, so now a lot of browsers got developed, but no editors, which wasn't the intention Tim Berners Lee had. He wanted to have editor <coughs> equals browser. So for him, the whole web he was proposing looked like Wikipedia, where everyone could click the edit button and do something different with it. So now we're running into a scene where users are consumers. It's not that users are developers anymore. It's not that, yeah, users are participating. Now in the 90s, they are all just consumers. Um, and then it happens uh, in the years after that the Cypherpunk Manifesto, which we had before, and the Declaration of Independent of Cyberspace got written, and similar texts along those lines, because now, as the users were consumers, activists figured, okay, something's going wrong. 
Um, if you don't know the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, you should definitely check it out. I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, and then uh, some of you might remember in the 90s, more and more attention got onto the web. Um, it everything gets famous, we all got modems at home, and a lot of new companies gone public. And towards the end of the century, they were overvaluated by the rising demand and the so-called dot-com bubble bursts, resulting in a stock market crash. Um, yeah, some of you might have been there. And um, now the scene is very different. All the money is gone, all the interest is gone, and now stuff like this happens. Wikipedia, blogs appear, Freifunk is uh, um, something which has founded in 2001, which is an initiative where people set up Wi-Fi antennas on houses to make own connections to each other, um, to just have like an internet, like an own network, um, not based on the actual internet. Um, so lots of projects like this happened then in the early 2000s, then 2004, um, the Web 2.0 was used for the first time, which goes back to the original idea of many-to-many. -many. The um, users are at least developing content again. 2005, the uh, National Science Foundation Internet backbone is switched off, and the Internet is now completely provided by private networks and commercial Internet service providers. This is the state till we are right now still. Um, which is a huge problem for net neutrality. I guess everyone in this crowd should be aware about the problem of net neutrality, is it? Who is not? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this is how it started. So, um, and this is still the problem that uh, the internet is now fully in commercial hands. Um, then, yeah, the commercial side came back. Facebook and Twitter got founded in 2006, but also WikiLeaks. And uh, here's a rough run of the latest news. Um, 2010, I got this number of 95% of all emails as spam. Um, then IPv4 addresses are gone out. Who knows about IPv4, IPv6? Okay, quite a few. Um, then 2012, some anthropologists were publishing an article where they said with 68 Facebook likes, you can predict people uh, pre-built skin color uh, by 95% probability. You can predict if they're homosexual by 88% probability. You can check if they're Democrat or Republican. It's been used for voting mainly, mainly by 85%. You can check on their intelligence, their religion, if they're <coughs> taking drugs, and if the parents of a person stayed together or not till uh, the person turned 21 years. And this only with 68 Facebook likes. And this has been published in 2012, which is now ten, five years back. Um, if you have <coughs> 10 Facebook likes, you can predict a person or you know a person like a working colleague. If you have 70, it's like a friend. If you have 150, it's like your parents. And if you have 300 Facebook likes, uh, you can predict as good as your partner. And if you have more, you can predict even better than yourself. And now, I mean, look, I'm not using Facebook, but look at the crowd out there. Uh, 300 Facebook likes you get from a person within 30 days. Um, so, uh, 2013, Edward Snowden uh, was publishing his stuff. And now we want to ask the question, is privacy not only political, but also technolo technological problem? Um, I don't know if anyone has an opinion on that. Okay, uh, yeah? It's both. It's both, yeah. yes, Indeed. yes, exactly, exactly. So there is a base of a technology, technological problem um, which we are trying to address and uh, which lots of hackers are trying to address. And there is a political problem which I guess all you are trying to address and also lots of hackers are trying to, trying to address and also Edward Snowden did a good job on that part. Um, but also he did a good job on showing us the technology problem. And this is the part where we want to go into. I'd like to add one sentence. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technological problem as such is there. And Zwa will tell you something about it, but it's probably worsened or it is worsened by the de technologies that are out there to break privacy. So it's, it's enhanced 
in a technological sense as well. So one has to think about that as well. So it's not only like solving bugs, but it's also like solving the problems to do bugging in terms of privacy. Exactly. Um, so you have heard um, in this history that um, lots of stuff got, got invented in the 70s, and I'm telling you we're, we're using that stuff till today, which finally brings us to this protocol thing which I was mentioning so often. So um, there are communication protocols. Um, there are three, three types of them we want to talk about to explain. Um, there is a human social protocol, there are software protocols, and there are network protocols. Um, anyone wants to explain some some of them, or has an idea about one of them? So the human social protocol is something like okay, how do we communicate with each other? We have to agree on a language. Wenn ich jetzt Deutsch spreche, wird mich kaum mehr jemand verstehen. So we have to agree on a language because otherwise, like you're not able to understand. Um, also, we might have to agree on grammar to understand each other. And then also, if I'm going to church, I might have to um, put on my, my jacket again. Or in some churches, I might even have to follow the protocol of covering my head, right? Um, so this is a social protocol where we define how to interact with each other, to communicate with each other. Um, so the same uh, works for network protocols, where there, there is defined how computers talk to each other. And there are software protocols um, that define how um, software should behave. Like PEP is trying to implement a software protocol on how email clients should behave. As in, Nana said that uh, key management is not needed anymore. But everyone who's into GPG would be wondering, OK, but how do you GPG without any key, key management? That's because we're telling the email clients how to handle the keys. So for example, every email shall attach the key, unless there is already encrypted communication and the key has already been ex exchanged. But by default, you just attach the key, so you already have one part of the key management solved. And this is what we can write into a software protocol. Um, and then we have network protocols which is, yeah, the rules of communication. When computers communicate with each other, um, there needs to be a common set of rules. Um, yeah, a set of rules uh, for data exchange, an agreement that defines how data is transferred between two or more parties, and uh, it defines the syntax, semantics, and the synchronizations of communication. And on the lowest layer, on the lowest layer you can imagine, um, a protocol defines how a link hardware should behave. Like you have a wire and it's going into a box and that box is making Wi-Fi. So here a protocol comes into place that tells, okay, how to transport this data into, like from the format of the wire into the format of the Wi-Fi. Or you have a cup of wire and it goes into a fiber wire or something. Um, so, uh, which protocols do you know about? Any we actually examples? Try we wanted to, make to it very interactive. Yeah, we were told to have it participative, but uh, you guys are <laughs> still in early morning mode. That's okay. Uh, um, where's the chalk? Ah, yeah, we have we have chalk. That's even nice, nicer. Okay. Any protocols you know about? Yeah. Yay! Uh, HTTP. Ah, okay, yeah. FTP. SMTP. Oh. SSH. FTCIP. No problem. Yes. Any more examples? There's even something like we have a <coughs> Bitcoin protocol. XMPP. Yeah. 
signal protocol? Yeah, that's called axolotl. Ah, uh, no, the signal protocol is not axolotl, it's the crypto thing, right? Yeah. Okay, any more? IRC? It's not a protocol. I don't know what the protocol of IRC is called, actually. Okay, but I think that's already fine. Um, so uh, here we have the uh, OZ model. Um, who has heard about the OZ model? Or who actually knows about it? Okay, quite a few have heard about it. That's great. Um, so the OZ model is just a model used in science. This is like lots of people would be saying this has nothing to do with reality. But it's still, as usual in science, it's good to imagine how stuff works to put it into a model which you can work with, where you have layers, where you have pieces. So um, it's, it's good to actually also understand that the, that the internet is on the bottom something physical, which many people like don't really realize. It goes into the earth at some point. Yeah. So um, so let's start at the physical layer. So uh, this is layer one, it's called uh, yeah, the physical layer, and there is Ethernet, so this is now example protocols. Ethernet, USB would be a protocol as well, Bluetooth, and uh, this IE uh, A100211. Um, this, are, uh, this is a Wi-Fi standard as far as I know. Um, so this is uh, where it is defined how stuff goes from one wire to the other. Then we have the data link layer, which is the Ethernet layer, um, where um, the stuff from the wires actually gets trans like, uh, translated into data, let's say. Then this data goes to the next layer, um, where it gets transported through the network. So now we have protocols that define a layer, and we have protocols how to communicate between the layers, right? Then we have um, the transport layer, then we have the session layer, the presentation layer, which is, for example, your uh, operating system, and the application layer, which is your actual application. So um, now let's see what we had. FTP is application, SMTP is application, this is email protocol, HTTP is application, SSH is application or presentation somewhere. Um, Bitcoin protocol is application, uh, TCP IP, oops, that's a yeah, C. Yeah. Um, TCP IP is, uh, we have it here, TCP and IP. Um, uh, what else did we have? XMPP is application, signal Sign protocol up. is application, TLS, TLS is a presentation. So except for TCP IP, we were now only on this layer with everything you told us. And I guess even if we had like the full, the, the full wall full of words, full of abbreviations, still we would have had mainly or m maybe even only uh, application and presentation layer protocols. So this is the part where your, your presence in the internet is like where you are in the application or on the presentation layer which is operating system and applications. Um, I leave this out, which is just a bit more of an explanation of this model, um, because we only have 20 minutes left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you use in the network? So you make emails, I guess, everyone. You're using web, otherwise you wouldn't have found here. Um, you would be using maps, you'd be using um, file sharing, maybe, you'd be using entertainment, like not only on the web, but also maybe this like TV stuff, um, you'd be using Tor, who's using Tor? Two less. <laughs> What else do you use online? What do you do online? Instant messaging, lots of messaging, right? Um, what do we have? You probably buy things and do online banking, maybe. True. Who doesn't do any online banking? Who doesn't buy anything in the internet? 
Okay. <laughs> but hackers, it might have been more. <laughs> Uh, what you else might you look for a job or something. So there's there's just like the in the more intense the internet gets, the more data you have to use to get what you want. It's just natural, but it's also well, you know about that. Yeah. Um, um, you also might use voice over <coughs> IP to talk to each other. Um, so this is stuff all uh, that you use, which you use in the current internet, which has a problem. Um, that the network uh, generally learns <coughs> too much. This IP protocol, which I told was done in 78, uh, generally learns too much. It leaks like information like crazy. In the header, you have the from, you have the where it goes, which port it goes to. Um, then you have insecure defaults and rather high complexity um, for management. You have lots of centralized components. And then um, you have even administrators, which might be malicious, they might be just incompetent, and even if they're nice guys and they're doing a great job, they are a target. So the people can say, okay, you're the administrator, you can get um, all the data. So uh, those floors are often misused. So that's um, like when we uh, talked about the stuff we're using online, again, most of it is on this application layer, and um, here is one uh, other layer thing where we made it a bit more concrete. Again, the physical layer, Ethernet, then the transport, and um, the application on top. So now, uh, just a brief insight. Uh, this is what Gnunet has uh, proposed. Um, there's about uh, to come a new release. And it's not for use yet, but it's for geeky testing. So there is the physical layer. We just use any kind of existing uh, protocol, whatever uh, needs to be there. Then there is an off-the-record uh, um, encryption right ahead. And uh, some um, distributed hash table routing. Then the um, transport layer, then uh, a name system, the new name system, and the applications which is at the moment uh, a voice over IP application, file sharing application, uh, some kind of a social networking thingy, and <coughs> um, yeah, PEP for email, Taller for, for payments, and but it's all in a like, yeah, experimental state. Mm -hmm. So this is something we hope to have in a couple of years for everyone out there. But if everything goes right, we will start this year by emulating GNU-NET to, as a first step, test the scalability. So as, as far as GNU-NET has been an academic project, or it, it emerged from an activism and academic background, and the code is there and it functions in what they do so far, but it hasn't been deployed so far. So we first start to test scalability if, it is able, if the GNU-NET is able to handle up to a million users, and this project is about to start. I hope if everything goes goes right, I don't know, second uh, quarter of this year, second, yeah, uh, and the Pep Foundation will run it. No. And at this point of time, it's really important that everyone who's a little bit more into just tries it. Um, don't install the release from 2014, uh, but take the one from the Git repository. <laughs> Please, and there will be hopefully a uh, like proper release soon. Also, don't take the packages in Debian or something because they're also the release from 2014. And then test it and find all the bugs. So it won't run most probably, but it's, yeah. Like, and there's an IOC channel, uh, hash GNU uh, on Freenode, where you can get all support. Um, so here we have on all, every layer, we have somewhat of an encryption, of an obfuscation, of a decentralization. Um, implemented and now uh, just briefly <coughs> what is crypto um, because yeah I had the feeling that lots uh, like it's n like non-technical crowd uh, it's a mathematical way to make the data only readable for the one sending it and the one receiving it which is then end-to-end -end encryption um, when you encrypt um, you get a code or a key so here is a simple encoding with a simple key I guess everyone can see what's the key of this encryption, right? The key is just turn every, uh, every word backwards. So this is very easy to see. 
Um, maybe as childs you had some like secret languages where you were exchanging some digits in the alphabet. So this is like simple encoding and then the key is okay, change everything like three letters into the alphabet or something. So nowadays we have software which helps um, how to choose software. Um, if it's old, it's good. Uh, check where it comes from, check if it got broken in the meanwhile, and um, check if it's open source. If not, don't use it. So PGP, what we've been talking about now often, <coughs> is pretty old, since 2091, uh, and it's open source. It's developed by a private person with a cause. Uh, this guy was actually um, an activist in uh, nuclear plants, activism, like anti-nuclear plants activism. And so he said, okay, we need something for encryption. So he uh, started PGP and it's still unbroken. Basic principles are confidentiality, integrity and authentication. And um, now we have another 10 minutes or 15 because what he said we can uh, take some of his time. It might take five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would uh, start this uh, last part with summarizing low and high hanging fruits. So we had the technological side of the privacy problem in terms of the structure of the internet, which offers way to, to intercept data. Uh, Gnune tries to solve that on a peer-to-peer -peer level. And then the other side, which I would say includes higher and lower hanging fruits, is the encryption itself can be good or bad and can be easy or not easy to use. So this just is a very rough <coughs> catch word to where we are now. Now the question is how, how, <coughs> how should encryption be? Are there important features? Of course if you try to look good encryption it tells you a lot about code, it should be not too long, it should be it should be as short as possible but as long as necessary and stuff like that. It shouldn't be broken if just one bit changes or stuff like that. We are focusing on a we have a bit of different focus here and generally of course uh, it should include flawless code and respectively or or respectively correct mathematics. So I won't go into details in that on that end. But of course, as I said, the PEP engine has been audited very closely. If you're interested in the audit, you can find it online. Uh, PEP Foundation docs. Um, the, for the following features outline more important qualities that proper encryption should have. And all of them are realized in PEP solutions, so we don't like uh, want to advertise too much, but I wanted to go a bit more into detail what PEP actually provides. First of all, of course, it's open source. Why is open source important? Because it makes sure that there are no backdoors installed, because other people can see the code, they can uh, like re 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 um, reread it and verify it, and this this makes sure that there are no hidden backdoors because it's just open and and the others will look at it. Um, decentra decentralization is an important feature. Why is this so? Because it avoids interceptions through third parties, also known as man in the middle attacks. If you don't, you don't want the admin to be to be able to read your private messages, as recently came out in the, in the case of Twitter, where people were like, what? They can read the admin can read my private messages. How can this be? Of course, in a te in a technical sense, it's just it's just um, no but nobody would really wonder. But of course, the user was like really surprised. In a um, so societal uh, sense in terms of what kind of societies we want decentralization avoid decentralization, decentralization avoid monopolies and uh, also it enables uh, innovation because it makes systems diverse and of course central databases also can get lost which is a huge problem because then your data is just gone and you should all uh, uh, have in your mind that there is no cloud, it's just the computers of other people. So, as I said, the internet is physical, it's physical on the other end because they're humans and it's physical in, in terms of the hardware. Um, then what does that decentralization mean in terms of what, what the encryption does? Um, 
It can mean end-to-end, -end, which means that endpoint-to-endpoint -end encryption is in place. Uh, and this, in other words, uh, says just you and me have the key and no one else can see it. It can also mean peer-to-peer, -peer. what does that mean? Which is, this is node-to-node -node communication. Uh, and in other words, this means that nodes take over the function of being clients and service to each, towards each, each other. So the network structure itself is a level out there, are no hierarchies. And in other words, it means just you and me have the media line of connection and no one else can listen. Then another important feature is verifiability, trust words. And here I come back to what I said in the beginning. So you know these uh, lines of numbers and, and, and uh, um, letters that you can read to it on the phone to verify your key. Uh, what PEP did uh, is mapping them on um, the alphabet of mother tongue languages. So we already have different languages installed, so it's, I think, Turkish, English, a, a whole list of them. And then you can just say, so oh, my fingerprint is battery or staple, for instance. And the other, the other person say, yeah, mine is this, and I can see it's the same. So it makes it much more easy. Um, and the handling of fi fingerprints gets intuit intuitive. Another key feature that we have now is key synchronization. Why do we need that? Because to actually use encryption on encrypted communication on the internet on a day-to-day -day basis, you want to be able to encrypt your email, you, to read your encrypted emails on more than one device. Nowadays we all have smartphones, we have tablets, we have different computers maybe. And the PEP KeySync solution is a real innovation because it for the first time provides a secure and decentralized, it's decentralized as, as well, <coughs> decentralized synchronizations of keys between different devices. Um, I don't know, I cannot promise any dates, but the KeySync is also sort of about to be released. As I said, we're, in, we're at different fronts in a, in a phase where we work on different releases and uh, they are about to come out this year or so. I hope, maybe. Uh, this shows you how the key sync in general functions. So the two devices talk to each other and they compare the key. They do the handshakes, handshake automatically and um, it's more or less the same process as if you do the key exchange with another user. It's just that the devices compare their keys. Um, then we have the question of compatibility. Um, why is this important? Because we want to have high usability, we want to have it spread, and this means that we don't want to have walled garden solution so that you only have, do you, that you have to use a specific app and then the other person has to have the same app. So the idea of PEP is that it really mm, enables communication between different different platforms, I said that already, programming language, crypto technologies, massive transfers, transfers and devices. So this was it about the features. Of course, we are here the whole day, so talk to us. Let us know if you have questions, um, if you want to cooperate, whatever. We are engaged in the community as well. Um, the PEP project as such is spread into different entities. There are commercial entities selling end-user apps because we really want to have it um, uh, deployed far in the society, so we do work together with uh, companies as well, and they have to buy it. But the o the software is open and free uh, for every normal citizen. And the PEP Foundation, which is the part of the project we are working for, it's a separate entity. We're non-profit. We're tax-free in uh, based in Switzerland, and we own PEP. PEP's core code, meaning these protocols that automatize these processes. And this uh, gives us security in terms of independent code and we cannot be sold out or bought because uh, the PEP Foundation only gives licenses to anybody who wants to use PEP software. And what we do as a foundation is we develop these core ba bases, um, we support other FOSS projects, we finance and coordinate code audits and we get engaged in political work. So if there is anything you want to uh, develop a project, you would like to cooperate, you would like to know uh, anything or, or, or whatever, talk to us or contact us online. This is, this is, this is our contact and 
This is a cool my side, thank you. Um, there's one thing uh, which I think we missed out to mention, uh, is that uh, the <coughs> idea of pretty easy is now we were focusing very much on the user's perspective, making the use of cryptography, cryptography very easy. Um, but the uh, PEP concept also, which we haven't, we haven't gone into the how it works technology-wise at all, um, but it is also pretty easy for a developer to plug PEP into their app. So if a developer has whatever, an SMS app on Android, they can just use the PEP engine and plug it in, and that's also why uh, the licenses, the models are very open, so that um, the uh, developer of the app is still the owner of the app, can use PEP and just enhance it with encryption. And just like plug it, plug and play, I wouldn't say because we don't have proper documentation <laughs> yet, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's the, the main idea as well. That's uh, when Nana said, uh, if you want to collaborate, I think that's a very important thing. Um, so if you know anyone who wanted to have encryption in his app or whatever uh, programming code he or she was writing and then was like giving up on it because, oh my God, this is like way too complicated, um, then you can point uh, that person on PEP and maybe uh, implement it there. So yeah, now the, you had a question. Yeah, thank you. I don't understand uh, how much PEP uh, depends uh, on the moonlight or how much PEP is just uh, about PGP. Yeah, At the moment, uh, uh, um, so the question was how much PEP does depend on the moonlight or how much PEP is just PGP? Did yes. I? Yeah? yeah. So at the moment we do not, we do not depend on Lunet at all. Uh, PEP is just uh, uh, an email encryption app. Uh, there are different releases all going into the direction of being email encryption apps. This is what we are starting with. One of our middle term goals is to implement Lunet in PEP, which means that we would be able to, on top of the uh, GNU PG, GNU PG, like the PGP encryption, uh, we would then be able to also protect metadata, but this is in its starting phase already. Uh, for, uh, 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 so far, it's in its starting phase. So the first thing we need to check is if the GNU net code is able to deal with really many, many users. So we first, as I said, and this is the particular project we will start in this year, uh, do an emulation for the GNU net code to test if it's able to scale. If the GNU net code is able to handle these this many users, then the next step will be to just Im to start working implementing it into PEP. And then it's a it's a combination. Then we will use both technologies. So far, it's only the PGP encryption. Just to add one thing, and then uh, so it's not depending on each other at all. Just PEP is one application for GNU net, so it's great for GNU net to have. And uh, we're going for mass encryption, but we also hope to go for mass anonymization, which we can only do with GNU net. Okay. Thank you. So if now is uh, the email application, how, how is it doing? Is it working? Uh, is already in a stable release? Uh? There's an, uh, an Outlook plugin, because as Nana was saying, like there's also <coughs> a company who's actually selling it to other companies, so Outlook is still the most common used uh, email tool. And there's an Android uh, client, which it's does... A, it's an Android and K9, um, K9 yeah. uh, 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 beta version. And there's Thunderbird already, let's say, working on various systems, but we haven't yeah. released it yet. As I said, there are several releases that are, ab are about to be finished. Uh, Thunderbird Enigma is about to come. The Keysync is about to come. Uh, there is a whole uh, developer team working on an iOS app. Um, yeah, it's actually pretty crazy because we are working on all those platforms at the same time, so it's pretty difficult to come. But up concrete with work is done. Many people yeah. work on that constantly, and, um, and yeah, watch the outlook, out for releases. Yeah, and the outlook thing is in production. Yeah. it's already s sold to like a particular amount of <coughs> um, companies. You should check your. Oh, our Twitter account because just recently there were uh, tweets about the uh, recent state of the uh, the different solutions yeah. and releases. So it's all in detail there and it can be found on the website. And well. also to highlight this again, so at the moment it's email encryption tools, but um, 
that's only now a proof of concept. The idea is that now if you have, for example, this PEP for Android installed on your Android, and then uh, we're going further with the development, then it doesn't only know GPG, it also knows about OTR. And then it doesn't only know about SMTP for email, but it also knows about XMPP. So then suddenly you can uh, talk XMPP with OTR to someone else with the very same app. And um, yeah, that's the, the basic idea of having those like hacker decisions been taken by software. All right, um, any more urgent questions? Otherwise we're gonna be around today. And uh, we have lots of stickers. Yeah, we have lots of stickers. My, my friend is that guy who also prints them, uh, those huge amounts for, um, for a Congress. Or if you find a, a, like a long, long, uh, lengthy yeah. text about the Pepper Nation, if you're interested in otherwise. Hello, I'm Walter. Um, I'd like to go in the last 15 minutes for the, the lower hanging fruits even. Uh, basically what I want to try to do is a little bit of an interactive mapping session on what people in this audience would recommend their, let's say, uh, non-techy, non-activist friends and family to use in their di daily lives. Um, just to get an idea of what's, what's, what's out there as far as we don't already have that idea, and also to, I hope to incite some people to fill in the gaps uh, that are undoubtedly there. Uh, this is punishment for using Acrobat. So the idea is basically uh, what are we looking for? Not so much about state uh, of the, of, uh, at state actors, because if your state actor is looking uh, is going for you, you are just boned anyway. Then you be better just stop using anything with a microprocessor in it. But mostly to uh, to raise the cost of the for the for the server surveillance economy uh, uh, players like Facebook, Google, etc. And these are more or less the constraints. Um, what uh, uh, what do a typical Windows or Mac OS or Android or iOS users uh, and do accept the fact that they will be permanently uh, lo locked into Facebook. So, let's say, Mike, what would you suggest as a plug-in to, uh, let's say, a uh, non-technical member of your family? Um, what sort of plug-in? As in, what would be the, the, the first, the lowest hanging fruit to help people to st stop being Tor? <laughs> Who else would advise that? Uh, can I have a show of hands? Four or five people out of this group would say Tor. So this may be slightly less low hanging fruit than... Uh, you were going to give another suggestion. Privacy badger. Privacy badger. Yeah. That was one I would have done myself, but yeah. Any other votes for privacy badger? That looks like a slight, at least a large group. I can't read it from there, but it's just for my own documentation afterwards. 
HTTPS everywhere. Yeah, would get my vote as well. But that's all web. What would you use for mail? Web. Mail. Say again? Mail. Like a... Mail. for Gmail. Stop using mail. I, I think the under 24 will be with you. <coughs> so now you are saying use another mail provider, like? You are suggesting another mail provider? Uh, yeah, using another mail provider, like Mailbox or Postio, SMB, Reza. <coughs> Like any of those who uh, like tell you that they're actually taking care of your privacy. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, like an offline client, like Thunderbird, for example, to avoid being logged in inside your browser all the time. Yeah, but then it sucks that your mail is never synchronized across your devices, which is a great about that mail. I mean, I use Thunderbird myself, but only on one computer, because it's an incredible pain to set it up in a way that you actually have your mailboxes in sync across different computers. That's yeah. Yeah. And although I'm now a stupid lawyer, I used to be a programmer in a long time ago in a faraway galaxy, so I'm not entirely non-technical. But yeah, uh, I'll put down as an option, local mail client. So you can enjoy the user experience of, of Enigmail for various variables of enjoyment. I'd suggest to install the uh, desktop clients for WhatsApp and Signal. Because if, you, if the threat model of, of uh, a PGP mail is to be with you know sending personal communications, and if you're trying to maximize the highest chance that the person on the other side will have yeah. access to a, a, the encrypted protocol, then I think the desktop client might I write down the signal desktop client because WhatsApp is evil and should be forbidden as and not open source. But taking at least half of your suggestion. That's uh, sorry for being such an, uh, such an asshole about that. Um, what I'm wondering about is, uh, and that's a bit of a, um, a mean question is I see an awful lot of usage of URL shorteners. Um, what would be an alternative to that? Because every time you use a URL shortener, the shortener service basically gets handed over your, a lot of your browser information for free. It's, it's, it's a new gatekeeper. Does anyone have a solution to the problem of the, uh, of the URL shorteners? Huh? I mean, using own URL shorteners. <laughs> I mean, roll, roll your own URL shortener, Ramon. <laughs> yeah. I know that's not like a very common solution. Actually, it's much easier to build than people think, but I would not say. Uh, um, uh, I think the problem of the URL shortener is uh, mitigated by privacy badger automatically. By what? By privacy badger. Is a. Uh, our domain uh, that installing to you or script or cookies, a privacy badger can uh, identify that as a hardcore domain. So, so you're suggesting the privacy badger already solves your URL shortener problem? Actually, it limits, as far as I know. Okay. I actually wouldn't know, uh, to, wouldn't be able to judge. I would expect the shortener service to still be able to see the re uh, refer URL and where you're coming from, etc., regardless <coughs> of privacy badger. But um. I know these two. Those are things that uh, the, the short term is C. Yeah. The short term is C. You refer some of yeah. your navigation information and uh, the extension URL, but the privacy badger limits uh, the information uh, that the, um, the kind of script they can execute and Google they can install. Yeah, fair enough. 
I'm still going to write down roll your own URL shortener. Although it's not going to get many votes, I'm afraid. Can you use QR codes? QR codes. Uh, you can't use them yourself for the simple hanging, the hanging proof. There might be QR codes instead of URL shorteners. You can send this picture. Uh, I may be missing something okay, here. Well, I was, uh, uh, for example, you're, you're sharing a URL on, on social media, and that's the point where people automatically use lots of shorteners. And that results in, in fairly easy patterns for the URL shortener yeah. service to follow. That's shortener service. Usually, usually your, um, uh, your threat model is not people using your URL shorteners, is that not more of a threat model? So, yeah, the average user, I don't think URL shorteners, the people you're talking about, you are know, low hanging fruit. I'm not sure people are often actively using URL shorteners. They're often getting their URL shorteners automatically. You know, I, I would already have love to have a browser extension that will recognize URL shortness and look it up in, in a different yeah, way badger. to circumvent them. I think privacy badger does that to some web but Twitter and so on. Okay. But yeah, I'm right. Then I have to look again at the privacy badge again. I know about one called is.gb. Um, Very hard to remember. I need to look it up every time I need to shorten it. And they are a privacy friendly shortener? Uh, an ethical one. An ethical one. I'm not sure if it's privacy friendly. How can you be ethical without looking after privacy? <laughs> IS.GB or GP? GD. GD. Yeah. Is good. Say again? Is good. Oh, yeah, is good. Yeah. I'm getting the joke now, yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit slow. I only had one coffee. It was Belgian coffee. It doesn't count. The services from Conocept. They have, uh, I think, the URL shortener. They have uh, even shortener for the images hosting. Of what was the name of the, uh, the host? Framasoft. Framasoft, okay. Anything else? How are we doing time wise, Guillermo? We have still 10 minutes. You could consider using uh, a VPN file that sync all the uh, known endpoints of trackers on your mobile phone. An example is disconnect.me. How, how much is a bit slow? Maybe it could take a few more seconds for some content to pop up. Because that's, that's the other bit that I had made a slide about, but given the problems I had with the projects, I didn't display it. Um, the mobile sphere is, I think, even harder because there's so much crap on everyone's mobile phone, or most people's mobile phone. Um, say again? Well, the fault, I think. I, I think you should, uh, uh, as a simple measurement, you should keep everything of your mobile phone. If it's not privacy enhancement or if you really want it. Um, that's a school of thought that may work for you, but good luck telling a 16 or 70 year old you can't do anything in your mobile that's really interesting. That's where the social life is. Not everyone wants to be a hermit, basically. Say again? Uh, yeah, you're right with it. So um, most of the measurements you have on the blackboard now are for enhancing privacy. So what we don't have right now is, let's say, leveraging privacy. And I would uh, suggest that if somebody has a special interest, he should install an app, configure that app for this special interest. OK, it's his business. But uh, not do it widespread. And okay, if you are collecting uh, lots of stuff on your mobile phone or on your other devices, 
you just have so many uh, different intention and have so many uh, di different thoughts that you will have to accept a lower level of privacy in the end, I suppose, for getting the convenience. Um, maybe it's a religious thing, but I don't want to believe that. I mean, there was a time when, the, when our devices were ours and the data on that stayed there and was our, were our, that was our stuff, basically. Yeah. And at some point we have, because the vast majority of us didn't realize it, we made it a, a, a looking glass for other interests. And I don't really care whether they're corporate or state or not. Uh, it's not me. Well, and I, think, I, I think the point is that uh, we pay with personal data for some services. And it's just established in some part of society, I think. I think even those younger or those older just do not care and they accept paying with their personal data. There's a, there's a lot of uh, research going, going on globally, both in the United States and in Asia and in Europe. And across all those cultures, as soon as people get told how much of the da their data is being collected, they are not comfortable with that in the, in the slightest. But the post-privacy argument, well, you're selling your data, is, and also falls flat in the face of the fact that if someone communicates with me, um, uh, for example, I don't have a Facebook profile, at least not a normal one, but I do have a shadow profile, because my phone number is in other people's phone directories and has been scooped up by Facebook app. And then you can say, well, you, you, you chose to opt out from Facebook. No, I, I, despite me choosing to opt out from Facebook, I still got opted in against my wishes. And my data has been sold by someone else as, as a currency for their love of being on Facebook. So I'm not really buying that argument, as in, uh, oh yeah, we have been doing this now for such a long time, therefore we should stay on doing it. It's like saying, oh, asbestos is such a cool material, we should keep using it. It has fantastic properties. You only get cancer of it, but that's just in the far future. I don't care. Well, what I think the main problem is that something has to be established, which is better. And you, even in the preceding talk, I uh, heard so much about a uh, lower level, uh, which we can build applications on, but I think we need the killer applications, including privacy, solving the privacy problems, which can be widespread, and be used and be attractive. And then we can enhance privacy in a really cool way, but, we, um, but I think otherwise we won't get that far. Oh, I do agree, it must be beautiful and useful and nice and all that. That's why I'm looking for simple things like browser extensions and, and just apps people can install because then you can uh, uh, easily run this mini privacy cafe for yourself and, and among your circle of friends. But we've been discussing too long already. I think you were... I uh, wave your hand. I advise to, to use uh, websites and with instead of applications because as we've seen, you can install uh, add-ons and web browser. So use uh, the website instead of the application. Um, okay, so as, as a general advice, you would say use the web versions of whatever online service you use instead of the mobile app because the mobile app will just use much more. Just one other comment on that. Basically, uh, with the tools, you're starting to make the issue invisible to the ordinary people, which takes the pain away. I think we first should have tools that make the problem visible. So, things like Privacy Badger that can show what trackers you have just missed out on. So, Ghostry can do that. Um, a, an app like Lumen, which on Android phones, will put in your face how many tracker plugins are in the app you use on a daily basis, you'd be surprised how often Facebook is called by your uh, email app that while you're not, you're not even a Facebook user, you don't even realize it's there. By I put that, on a light beam, light beam as an extension. Yeah, yeah fine. But, but make it visible first, because yes. otherwise there is no incentive. And then I think the key question is, do you want to make the problem go away by masking it, because that's what this is about, or do you want to fundamentally change it? And then the question I would have also in the audience is, would you accept 
the problem to be reduced to such a level that it becomes bearable, and that's what these tools do, or do you want to re-engineer properly from the start with privacy in mind, which is basically what you're doing. <coughs> so the, the risk of doing this is that you make the real problem or maybe even invisible and bearable rather than structurally fixing the internet. Cool. I think that's a very interesting point. At the same time, what I love about, for example, the privacy cafes uh, that, and, and the crypto parties is um, it gives people a sense of agency. They can, people tend not to bother about problems they have a feeling they can't do anything about it. And if they can do a little thing in their own life, that already is an empowering action. There's at least two hands in the back. Uh, yeah, I, I also agree with that. It's obviously, you know, it would be much better, but uh, like re-engineering everything from the start is, is hardly a low-hanging fruit. Um, and it's not nothing that, that, that normal users are able to do. Okay. And also, in, to the kind of things that have been said before, we should not fall into the trap to think that the privacy and non-privacy is a binary thing. It's not like I, don't, I have privacy or I don't have privacy. That's not how it works. It's a gradual, you know, think of it like a shifter. And the more you can shift it towards privacy, the better it is. And even if it's just a little bit, um, and, and it's always worth it. Also, better is the enemy of good. Behind you. I think in, in, in relation to those last two points, uh, we focus a lot on the online world, but there's a lot of offline tracking as well, such as loyalty cards and so on. Um, and especially from, from May, one of the most powerful things I think you can do to encourage organizations to re-engineer is to make subject access requests and to tell normal people to do it, which they almost never had in the past. But many of these organizations, shops, and, and even tracking organizations, are actually just not used to responding to subject access requests from normal people. And getting a lot of those does force organizations to think about how they re-engineer things in the future, questions that may not have always come up. So these aren't always big, bad actors. Sometimes they're just actors that have never been pushed to, to think about it. But Mr. Freedom has a subject access request letter generator for the Netherlands. How many other member states do have similar websites that you can just type in your name and you get a... I'm oh, sorry. There are databases in the UK, um, but it's a bit tough. But it's not be easy when they're electronic. Uh, still in the UK, a lot of um, a lot of data controllers only will accept physical letters. So oh, but the, 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 the beauty of that letter generator is it just generates a PDF for you to print out. And That's good. Yeah, right. Also, bear in mind that processing a letter is easily costing tens of euros for the recipient. Mm. Well, usually it's like 10 euros to yourself. Yeah, but it's so much nicer than dialing a phone number and having to listen to Muzak and, and all that. That's so much, more, so much more of a pain for them. Uh, yeah, that bit's come to change. Yeah, I would like to add something because I know that if you want to stay, uh, the, the, like we engineer everything from the start, privacy very, very, very quickly becomes a problem that is not only related to privacy as such, but it's about, it's, a, it's related to how our society work, how capitalism work, because they do it for control and they do it for money, uh, same as they try to evade taxes and everything. So, of course, this is a high hanging fruit. Uh, you can choose to be political, you can choose to do some, to try to do something on, 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 on either side of the thing. You can also engage in environmental work or whatever. Um, but if you want to break it down to what you can do in terms of low hanging fruit, you can also say choose a job, choose, a, choose, choose an eth ethical job, uh, I don't know, engage in activities that include privacy in their ethical structure, uh, try to support those projects and the like to just uh, spread the infrastructure for more things to evolve and emerge <coughs> that, that try to solve those deeper layers of the thing. I'm not going to reply to that. A, a last question to the group. What would you do about Wi-Fi tracking in public spaces? Not using... Say again? If you have a Samsung phone, app randomization always never works. Yeah, I've seen apps that will turn off your Wi-Fi as soon as you're from a, uh, in, an, uh, in an unfamiliar location. Yeah, Mac randomization is quite a good defense in most cases. So Apple phones, for example, and some Androids yeah. will try to be randomized apps. That's aggressive. So it's very fundamentally broken by design in the case of Samsung. Ah, good to know that. Don't buy a Samsung phone. Well, if you can afford it. And they're actually not that cheap. Mac randomization is in the brain.
this Wi Fi back in time. For now. Uh, yeah, there are some weird identification attacks that you can ask someone for about 20 minutes maximum based on other fingerprinting on the device. That's enough for a lot of public spaces. Um, and I think it's about time. So I would like to thank you for bearing with me with this entirely unstructured, vague thing. So um, thank you. <laughs>